Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for the Link to Liturgy online school. Uh, we are now in Course 2. Uh, course 2 asks the question, can we have God without Jesus Christ? And of course, we will never be able to have a full um, understanding of who God is without Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is God, and He fully reveals God to man. Um, and so with this, it's important to kind of, uh, three things we'll do in this section are in this course, um, course two, we'll look at Genesis and Exodus and how Jesus was prefigured and um, already spoken of um, through typology in Genesis and Exodus, and then also look at the, a little bit of an intro into the Gospels of who Jesus is and how he reveals the Father. Uh, this lesson, we're particularly looking at um, uh, Moses. This is called Moses' Map. But we're going to look at uh, what happened when we, why this book is called Exodus, because they're they're leaving, they're making an exodus, and so um, it's important probably um, either at the end or maybe stop the video now and read the entirety of Exodus um, 12 through 24. Those 12 chapters are going to give you a full picture. Um, sometimes when we're reading scripture, we read it in just segments, so we don't get the entire context. Um, but these 12 chapters are absolutely amazing. And what we're going to do is go through and, and give all the typology, talk about all the typology. Typology is simply something that is a, a person, place, thing that is just pointing towards a reality in the New Testament. So it's something that's a foreshadowing or a prefigurement of a deeper reality. Of course, many of these things will be, of course, Jesus Christ or his church or the sacraments. Um, because Jesus Christ, the church, the sacraments are all the perfection of and the fullness of what we hear in Genesis and Exodus. Um, first, I think it's important just to realize a few things. One, the Israelites, um, how did they end up coming into Egypt? Um, we, we remember the story of, um, we have Abraham, of course, Abraham, Isaac, and then um, Isaac's son, uh, Jacob. Um, Jacob's name, uh, so Isaac, um, sorry, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. You can always remember that. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. This is important um, because, um, you know, the, these, these will be, he'll have the 12 sons of uh, Jacob, we'll call it the 12 sons of Israel. And so a name given to the Israelite people were the sons of Israel. Um, in, in the Lamb of God, hashtag Lamb of God, we talk about how important how the sons of Israel are continually spared. When we um, look at the plagues, it was the sons of Israel that were continually being spared from the plagues. And they lived in a, in a section called Goshen. If you look on the online school um, for this section, we have an overlay. Um, the whiteboard is, is kind of um, I guess you could say the map, the real map, is going to be overlaid on top of the whiteboard so you can see um, how this looks. But for now, on this video, we're just going to focus on, on a few things on the whiteboard. Uh, so the land is Goshen, where they're living. That's kind of a, a certain section of Egypt where um, all of the Israelites are living. Uh, now, Abraham is already told that his descendants will end up in Egypt. So remember, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph... Of the 12 um, sons of Israel, it's Joseph who is betrayed by his brothers and he is sold into slavery into Egypt. And that's how Joseph ends up getting into Egypt. And ultimately, that's how um, the, the, the Israelites will be kind of um, end up there and, and grow there. And um, this is told already. God tells this to Abraham in Genesis 15, 13. Let me read that. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be slaves there and they will be oppressed for 400 years. So not only is Abram given this vision from God that his descendants will end up being slaves and sojourners and, and occupy a land that's not theirs or be in a land that's not theirs, but even gives how long they will be there, 400 years. Now, when we go to, it's important to get some of these details right so you can understand the context of the story here. Exodus 12, 40, we, um, or let's go up to 37, sorry, Exodus 12, 37. And the sons of Israel, again, using that word, sons of Israel, that's going to be important because the new Israel is the church. So just as the sons of Israel were saved back then and they were spared and taken care of back then, the sons of the church will be spared now. Just like the sons of Egypt and the son of Pharaoh in the world 
uh, perished back then. Now it will be the sons of Satan, those that refuse to be a son of, of the church that will be um, uh, perished now. So we want to be sons and daughters of the church, um, which is to be a son and daughter of, of God. Um, all right, so the, and the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So this is important, 600,000 people. That's over a half a million people. And here they're just mentioning the men. They're saying besides women and children. So if you imagine 600, uh, maybe half a million families, this could be, could be easily 2 million people here. Um, so this is a lot of people. When, when we put this in context, sometimes we see you know, the movies and it's, it's impossible to kind of understand the enormous amount of, that the Israelites had grown in just 400 years. So 430 years, they had grown tremendously. Um, now we hear kind of this in 40, verse 40. 40. This is Exodus 12, 40. The time that the sons of Israel dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of the 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept by the Lord, by, the, by all the sons of Egypt throughout the generations. Um, and so, so here we have the amount, the magnitude of this. Um, now in, in uh, 1317, we see that the route that they are going to go. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of land of the Philistines, all, um, although that was near. For God said, lest the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people round by the way of the wilderness towards the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Um, so it, this is important to note that if they would have just gone from Goshen straight to Cana, the promised land, and you can see this on the whiteboard, uh, if they would have went by the way of land, Exodus 13, 17, um, then they probably would have got to Cana, you know, maybe I think people say in a seven days, so maybe a week. Now, of course, with all of these people longer than that, but it definitely would have taken 40 years. Of course, the 40 years of wandering is a punishment that they're given, and we read about that later on. Um, but why? It's not Pharaoh that decided this route. It's God that decided this route. Remember, it's God that liberates them, and it's God that decides the route. And the reason God would not let them enter into the land so quickly is because he thought that they would repent once they saw that they had to fight. Um, when they saw the, 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 the Canaanites and when they saw the armies, uh, they would uh, repent of what they wanted to do. Repent me here means turn back from their goal of going, and they would have returned to Egypt. So imagine, here you are enslaved for over 400 years, almost 2 million people perhaps. You, they're, they're finally liberated from Egypt. They get to Cana, and they see the war that they will have to enter into to gain that ground. They're not strong enough yet. God knows that they're not strong enough yet. And they just simply willfully return back into that slavery. Um, this is so true of our own life. This is a typology of our own life. You know, we want God save me. God save me. God liberate me. And, and God does not always give us the quickest route to heaven. He doesn't give us the quickest route to sanctity. In fact, I think, I don't know of anyone that has had that happen to them. If we simply stroll into heaven, you know, many times what happens is, is once we have a, a, a desire to get out of the slavery of sin, it's not just a cakewalk right into heaven. Um, we still have to battle. The battle for us is not against the Canaanites. Uh, the battle for us is against the devil, the flesh, and the world. And so, yes, we ask to be liberated from the devil, the flesh, and the world, but we also have to battle the devil, flesh, and the world. When we realize that that battle is real and, and we understand that that battle is hard, sometimes we want to go right back into captivity. And, and so what God many times will do for us, I think it's, it's the majority of the time, is he will have us um, face some trials in the desert. He will have us kind of build up that interior life that we will have to put on the armor of God so that we can uh, go in and face these battles before we get to heaven. So this whole story is really a type of us 
we are the sons of Israel. That we are sons of the church. We are the sons of the Israel. Israel, he does not let us go the direct route. We must go the harder way. We, this is a pilgrimage for us. Um, this is what we say in the Hell Holy Queen prayer. This is a valley of tears. There is a struggle here, and that struggle is real, and we need to um, take on all, all, the, all the weapons that God gives us so that we can go into um, the promised land, which is for us heaven. Remember, we are the church militant. The sons of the church are called the church militant. So there is no walking into heaven without a fight. We will always fight the devil, the flesh, and the world. Um, so what happens here, instead of um, going the direct way, he's going to send them down, uh, uh, further down to where they're going to have to pass through the Red Sea. Now we know what happens is once they start going uh, that way, Pharaoh decides, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my whole workforce. I can't let these people go. So he chases after them. This puts, if you look on the map, this puts um, basically Pharaoh and uh, all of this bad stuff on one side, and then it puts the Red Sea on the other side, and the Israelites are, are sandwiched in between. They either have to cross the Red Sea, or they have to go back to Pharaoh, to Egypt, and to slavery. Now, this is the, also the position that we are put in. We can see Pharaoh as a type of the devil. We can see slavery as a type of the flesh, the sins that we are in. And we can see Egypt as a type of the world. We are asking Jesus Christ to deliver us from Satan, from our sinfulness, and from the world. The devil, the flesh, and the world are, are how we, we renounce those at our baptismal vows. Do you reject Satan? I do. Do you reject all his empty promises? I do. And do you reject all his evil works? I do. So there we are renouncing the devil, the flesh, and the world, uh, which is uh, prefigured in Exodus by Pharaoh, slavery, and Egypt. And so what will we do? Will we, will we be masters? Uh, I mean, will we be servants? And will we be under the dominion of Satan and sin? and the world? Or will we go through the waters of baptism? Will we cross that Red Sea and be liberated from um, sin and from Satan and from the world? And that's what we choose to do. So we reject Satan, we reject the evil works, and we reject his empty promises, thus going through the waters of baptism into this valley of tears, into this pilgrimage as sons of the church, and on our way to the promised land. As soon as we cross over, it's not only God who, who directs the path, it is also God who gives the liberation through baptism, and then it is God who will give every provision when we're in the desert wandering um, on our pilgrimage to heaven. And even, even before that, sorry, I need to backtrack just a little bit more, because in Exodus 13, it talks about two things that are important. Uh, the Israelites are going to be guided by a pillar um, of fire at night, um, and then a cloud, kind of like a tornado during the day. These are prefigurements of the church, which is the pillar of, of truth. Um, the church has been called uh, the, the pillar of fire and, and, the, and, the, and the cloud, the pillar of uh, cloud and fire, because it will be the church that will guide us. This is also a typology of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Holy Spirit is given to the church, given to the apostles to guide them. Um, so that's important. And then also, uh, we see that in Exodus 13, they are asked to consecrate the firstborn males. Um, so let me read this. This is 13:11. And when the Lord brings you into the land of Canaanites, so it's not a, a question of if, it's when, when you get to be into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers uh, and shall give you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. So this would be the firstborn. Uh, that are that are consecrated, and this is why Jesus, who um, opens the womb of Mary, right, is the firstborn of Mary. Um, she will be, he will be then um, consecrated um, and presented in the temple. So this is um, this law that Jesus puts himself under, and Mary puts himself puts herself under, is actually given in Exodus 13. That's important to rec uh, to to realize that. Um, all right, and why is it that sorry? And why is it that the firstborn were given, um, consecrated to God? Um, and this is a tradition that continued uh, until, of course, the time of Jesus. And we see this in Jesus. The reason that the the firstborn were always given to God is because the firstborn were saved um, in that tenth plague. It was uh, the sons of Israel 
that firstborn that were all saved there. So what happens now when the Israelites pass into um, the promised land? We see, I'm, we're going to go through chapter by chapter here and just give a few of the typologies. And uh, so what happened to them? And then what does that mean to us and especially to the Christian life, um, um, to all of us that are the sons of the church? Exodus 15 they see that um, there is some bitter water. Of course, when you're in the desert and you're traveling and you have two million people, you definitely need water. And so um, Moses is told to throw um, wood into the water. This is uh, 15. Let me see if I can find the exact verse here. The bitter water is made sweet. So this is uh, 1522. Then Moses led Israel onward from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur, they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Okay, no water in three days for this large of a group is a really bad thing. When they came to Morah, they could not drink the water of Morah because it was bitter. Therefore, they named it Morah. And the people mur murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. This is important, a tree. Genesis, there was a tree. The cross, the holy cross is a tree. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. So here we have a reference to the Holy Cross, the tree of life that is thrown into the water, makes the water sweet. Um, here, a lot about suffering here. There is a bitterness of suffering that is real for all of us, and it is really only by throwing the cross into our bitterness that then the, the, the bitterness of, of suffering actually can become sweet. Um, this sounds like a strange thing that suffering can become sweet, but our suffering connected to the suffering of Christ on the cross makes the bitterness not only sweet, not only manageable, but actually salvific. It can save souls. So uh, the misericordia, the word mercy comes from misericordia. Cordia means heart. Miseria means misery. So literally throwing the heart upon the misery of another throwing that cross, the suffering of Christ, into our bitter uh, suffering in our life. Um, so this is a typology of how we understand suffering. In 16, uh, we have the manna from heaven. This is very beautiful that every morning when the people need to eat, um, there is this dew, this, uh, this uh, snow-type uh, covering on, on, the, on the dirt, on the sand, and they can gather that up and eat that. Um, they, they have to rely on God because it is given only once a day. If they keep it, um, then it will uh, mold and get worms and gross. So they have to rely on Jesus for their daily bread. So this is, of course, a typology of the Eucharist. This is a typology of God's providence um, taking care of us daily. As we say in the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Of, of fully, completely relying on God every single day for everything that we need, both temporal and spiritual. Uh, we see at one point that they were given the manna, the bread in the morning, and then they were given the quell, the flesh of a bird um, in the evening. So again, there's a connection between uh, the bread and the flesh, which is all a type of the Eucharist. Um, also in 16, let me find it here, we have water from the rock. So not only has the bitter water become sweet now, um, all of this is 17.1, all the congregation of the sons of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephibadim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Again, no water. Therefore the people found fault with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you find fault with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the, but the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why do you bring us up out of Egypt? to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the rod which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come from it, that the people may drink." We call Jesus the rock. We call Jesus the, the foundation. This rock of Horeb is a, a foreshadowing, a typology of Jesus Christ himself, who is our rock, the rock of ages. And when is Jesus Christ struck? He is struck with a spear on Calvary. And so as they thrust the spear in his side, 
he is struck, the rock of ages, Jesus Christ our rock is struck, and water pours forth from his side, not only to nourish us, but to nourish us through the waters of baptism, particularly the blood and water flow, the water representing baptism, the blood representing the Eucharist that saves us. Um, so this is the sacred waters that um, will quench our thirst. Remember, this is what the sons of the church, the new Israel, drink. Those that are not sons of the church will continue to thirst and ultimately will die in their thirst. So again, you know, if you're watching this video and you're not baptized, come to those waters, you know, come to the water. You know, this is it's in a lot of songs, you know, come to the water, drink, because those that are sons of the world, those that are sons of Satan will continue to thirst. They will continue to search for things. They will continue to murmur. They will continue to say, why am I here and what is my purpose? Let me return back to, to, the, to Egypt. Uh, let me stay in Egypt, willingly persisting in sin. But no, come to the rock, Jesus Christ, who has been struck for you and drink from those waters. Um, now we have 17. This is um, when uh, Amalek attacks Israel and Israel is defeated. Um, I'm sorry, when, when Amalek attacks Israel and Amalek is defeated. And this is beautiful because it talks about Moses and, and the leadership of Moses. Then Amalek fought with Israel at uh, Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men to go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow, and I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So this rod is really kind of representing, of course, um, the shepherd's staff of our bishops that will lead us uh, on this pilgrimage. So our bishops along with us are our leaders, and they will be given the job to lead us on this pilgrimage when we're, when we're walking to heaven. And so the staff is very important. It does many, many things throughout this journey. Um, so Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. So Joshua, Joshua was going out to do the fighting. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Uh, whenever Moses held his hands, held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat upon it. And Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other. These are the hands of Jesus Christ on the cross. When we look to Jesus Christ in our battle against the devil, the flesh, and the world, when we look at his outstretched arms nailed to the cross, his arms, tired, right, tired, were, were placed there by nails so that we could be assured of his victory, that he would continue to keep his hands up forever. As we gaze upon a, the, the, the crucifix, we realize his sacred hands are always outstretched for us. They're always ready to embrace us. They're always ready to show how much he loves us. You know, we are, you know, little kids, you know, we say, how much does Jesus love you? This much, right? He loves you this much and he died for you on the cross. And so this is a beautiful um, uh, story here. Uh, then we have um, kind of the governings. And in 18, we see how the Israelites will be governed. And, and they do this in uh, kind of regiments, in a sense, of 1,000, 100, 50, and then 10. Let me see if I can find this part. Um, but this is definitely an in, in 18. Um, okay. So Moses gave heed to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Because at this time, all of these people are coming to Moses continually. And Moses um, is getting older, and he can't lead all of these people. And so his, um, his father-in-law is going to give him advice on how to rule the sons of Israel. Jesus Christ um, gives the 12 apostles his authority, and he gives the 12 apostles the authority to ordain future apostles. And so we are a church, the new Israel, that are governed by bishops and the pope. And this comes from even the governance all the way back in Exodus. So Moses gave heed to the voice of his father-in-law. This is 1824. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of a thousand, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times, hard cases they brought to Moses, but any smaller matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own country. So we see already that uh, there is this uh, sus subsidiarity in which um, there are, are people appointed, men particularly that are appointed, um, to, to judge 10 people. 
and then uh, people that are over that, um, 50, 100, and then 1,000. And then they took the hard cases, of course, to Moses. This is still the way that governance happens in the church. We have a parish that is um, under the, the, the mission of the priest. We have the priest that is under the mission of the bishop. And we have the bishop that is under the, the mission of the pope. Um, typically, you know, the priest has the authority at his parish, um, but of course, any matter that um, can be taken to a bishop. The bishop has ultimate govern governing authority and is the final say in a diocese. And if there is any issue with the bishop, then of course, that's taken to the Holy Father, to uh, the Vatican, to the Holy See. Um, so we see that governance already happening, um, which is necessary. Why is the governance necessary? To get the people to the Holy Land. Why is the governance of the church, the hierarchy of the church necessary? To guide, to govern souls to heaven. Um, and then we have 20 through 24. There's a lot here, um, but ultimately I just want to make the connection here um, with the law being given. The law is given to Moses, the Ten Commandments. Up to this point, the people had not had these precious laws. Uh, the first three talking about love of God and the, the second seven um, having to do with love of neighbor. And so they had yet had these, um, these precious, I mean, really the gift of the Ten Commandments is amazing. And, you know, when we think about how much we rely on the Ten Commandments to um, examine our own conscience and to live by, this is the standard. The church even says for someone coming into the church through baptism, an adult needs to know um, the certain precepts and obligations of the church. And these can be found in the 12 articles of the creed and the 10 commandments. At the basic level, what someone needs to know are those 22 things, the 12 articles of the creed and the 10 commandments, and to live those out. You really cannot be going to confession regularly if you are not living out the Ten Commandments. If you are willingly persisting in any of the sins that are spoken of in the Ten Commandments, then uh, you really can't um, go to a valid confession. You have to be willing to repent. So the Ten Commandments become a, a real measuring stick for us. Of course, they're perfected in Jesus Christ, who, uh, t who teaches us really how to live the Ten Commandments, but they're still on the books. And the Ten Commandments is, is given on the 50th day of this journey. That's why we call it Pentecost. So on the 50th day of this journey, Moses is given the law, the Ten Commandments. And um, it, the connection here between confirmation is that it will be on the 50th day after our Lord rises from the dead that the Holy Spirit is given. And can we even follow the law at all? The, the Ten Commandments, the law of love, the law of God, law of neighbor. Can we follow Jesus Christ at all without the Holy Spirit? The answer is no. And so just as the Israelites were given this great gift of the law on their 50th day of their journey, the Christian, the sons of Israel, are given the Holy Spirit on the 50th day after the resurrection. So I want to note here just at the end of this lesson the importance of the sacraments of initiation. Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist and how it ties in. Baptism is when the, the sons of Israel crossed the Red Sea and were liberated from uh, Pharaoh and from slavery and from the world. For us, the sons of the church, baptism liberates us from the, the, the attack of the devil, the flesh, and the world. As we get into the journey in the desert, we are um, given water. We are also given the Eucharist, the manna. And so the Eucharist becomes, just like it was for Elijah, strength for the journey. And then we are given the great gift of the Holy Spirit, just as the sons of Israel were given the law to lead them and, and to direct um, just everything that they did as a community, but also their witness to the pagans. Also, the Holy Spirit um, is the soul of the body of Christ, the church. It is the glue that brings together all of the uh, bricks of the temple of the church. Um, all of us are living stones in that temple. So the Holy Spirit not only helps us as a community to be of one mind, right, in one spirit, but also it will be the, um, the witness that we will have as we go out to all those that do, know, do not know Christ and do not know his church. Thank you for joining me for this lesson and course two of the Linked Liturgy Online School. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.